So if you go back to 2002, and some of you will remember this, it was when Rick Warren first wrote and published a book that was called The Purpose Driven Life. Sound familiar? It was an immediate success. It made the New York Times bestseller list, and it was on there for a whopping 90 straight weeks. By 2012, so 10 years later, 32 million copies of the book had been sold. By 2020, 50 million copies had been sold and translated into 85 different languages. And I actually have two copies of the book. I looked on my shelf, and I have no idea why I have two copies of The Purpose Driven Life, other than maybe my life's a little complicated. I don't know. But uh, if anybody wants to read them, I have several that you can share here. But why was this book such a hit? What was the core that it struck? Well, it attempted to answer a question that I think every person struggles with, and it's this question, why am I here? But for most of us, we focus on this idea of the why. What is it that I'm supposed to be about? What's my purpose? Uh, What am I supposed to accomplish? Is there a reason I'm supposed to get up and, and do what I do every day? But at the same time, there's a second part of that question, and that's right where we want to go today. And as we start this new series called God's Green Earth, the question is, why am I here? Not just in Waterford, but why am I here on this planet? How did I get here? And and what is the significance of my being here, if there is some significance to it? And, of course, I think that there is. So Warren went on to retitle his book, and if you pick it up today, you'll find it with this title, What on Earth Am I Here For? And I like that, because it picks up this idea, what on earth am I here for? So there's two parts of this question, the purpose part, what am I supposed to be all about? But then there's the place part, how did I, or how did any of us get here? And that's a question that we need to wrestle with. And it's a question that's essential to answer. And that's what we're going to attempt to do, at least to start to do this morning. And we're going to continue on as we go through this story, or this series called the, 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 uh, God's Green Earth. The here is earth, and earth is an important part of our stories. In fact, I think just about all of you, maybe 100% here, um, earth is a part of your story. Starting from the time that you were born, from in the hospital, they went in there, they asked your parents, you know, what is the name of, of, of you? And uh, um, by the way, my name was supposed to be Randy, and, uh, so if, if you, um, but the neighbors across the street had their baby like two weeks before I was born, and they named their baby Randy, so that was off the books. And uh, so it was a great mystery when I was born what my name was going to be. Uh, it was a mystery to my father, at least. And uh, so my mom announced that it was Brent. My dad was like, I've never heard that name before in my life, but okay, go. Let's go with it. You know, at that time, that's, that's a good solution, right? So that's how I got my name. But that's part of our birth certificate, the name. But what is the other part? The date. Okay, well, it's the other part, the place. So if you have a birth certificate, it tells where you were born, where you arrived on planet Earth. Now, if you're like me, not only do I have two books on the purpose-driven life, I actually have two birth certificates, okay? That's a different story that we'll share for another time. But both of them do say that I was born in the same place. I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Anybody else born in Grand Rapids, Michigan? Butterworth Hospital? Okay, yeah, so we all have our plaques on the wall there, the Hall of Fame, all four of us. Okay, that's pretty cool. But, uh, or Spectrum, whatever it's called now. But uh, just this past week, I was visiting as I mentioned before, my daughter in New Hampshire. But we drove through Canada to save time, kind of, except going through the border is a little bit slow. But at the, bo- at the border, they ask you for your passport, which tells you where you're from, your place. But then they also say, where are you going? And so, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to New Hampshire. I'm on the way back. I'm going to Detroit. Where do you live? I live in Clarkson. These are all of our places and place is important to us because we are very much earth creatures. And so for a few weeks, we want to talk about earth and the role that it plays in our human stories. And maybe we've never really stopped to think about that, but it fits with our boldly grow theme that we're going on. But we realize that if God created the earth, then the earth must play a part in our spiritual stories, but it also plays a part in our human stories. But our human stories and our spiritual stories are the same story 
And earth is an important part of it. So we want to go back to the beginning, the origin. How did this all get started? And so we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, which is a great place to start because it's so easy to find. First place, first page, well, after the table of contents or whatever, in the Bible. Now, I realize when we talk about origins, there's a lot of different conversations that go on around this, from creationism to intelligent design to naturalism to evolution. Those are not really my purpose today to discover or, or to discuss those things. But my purpose is more to just walk through Genesis chapter 1 and on a little bit into Genesis chapter 2 and explore this idea of earth and what it's all about. And so it's a story we would say about earth. It's a story that's about God. It's a story also about humans. It's a story actually about the story. So this is what we're going to do today. And it's going to be a little bit different. For all of you who like to follow along on outlines, it's going to take you a second to catch on to what we're doing. But we're going to hit these four themes in the story. So as we read through the story, when one of these themes or categories comes up, we're going to stop and we're going to address it and we're going to make a point. But they don't all come like, you know, it doesn't all go story, then God, then earth and mankind, or it doesn't go, you know, sequentially and we go back there. So it bounces around a little bit through this, through this passage. But these are the four themes that are going to come out as we read through the, the first chapter of Genesis here. So, Genesis 1.1, this is where we start. This is the trailhead. <clears throat> but before we start, <clears throat> I want to remind us that when anytime we open up Scripture and we're trying to interpret it to know what it means, one of our tools that we use is the tool of context. So the tool of context requires that we look at what's surrounding the verse. Well, we can do that with what's coming behind the verse, but we can't really do that with what's coming before the verse because there's nothing to do it with. So when we talk about context, we don't really find our context in the text itself. We actually find some context in the history itself. And so this is about the story, but the story was actually written by, not, that's not the way I just said it, the story was written down by Moses. He wasn't an eyewitness. In fact, we think that it was about 2,500 years after creation that Moses was writing the story down. So that's a pretty big chunk of time. But why was it that Moses was writing down the story, and what was the event that was bringing about the story? Well, the story was being written down, and how did he get it? You know, maybe he got it through oral traditions, but we know that when Moses was called up to Mount Sinai, he was given the law, which was the Pentateuch. And we often think of that as like all those rules that were laid out there in Exodus and in Leviticus, and that Moses was up there on the mountain just writing down all these rules. Moses was up there writing down these books, including this uh, um, history, historical record of how creation started. So this was actually a story that may have been passed down from moral traditions, but it was given by God to Moses 2,500 years after the fact. But why now? Why is it that God's saying, okay, now is the time. I want you to write this down. Well, it has something to do with the history of Israel. So we could say this about the story. First of all, Moses is writing this so that we have a record for the ages. Up until this time, it had been passed down. Any story had been passed down through oral tradition. But now we have this record that says, this is the story. So we have this record for the ages. But secondly, it's so that the Israelites have a context, or actually what I would say, they have a setup for the rest of the Pentateuch. And so as we explore this story, this story is, is informing the Israelites who are entering into this covenant relationship with God at this point in their story. And so these two things are connected because their history is going to shape their future. So that is the context of this story. Let's read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we go to our next category here. It's God. Now, 
Moses, who's the author here, he is not arguing here for the existence of God. He is not saying, God created this world, and I'm going to present all this stuff that's laid out here, and this is going to be proof that God exists. It's already assumed that God exists. And Moses is not arguing for the existence of God. He's just saying, we know, we know there's a God. This is the story of how our stories and God's stories inter, intercepted or, 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 or um, became intertwined. So his existence is assumed. Now, sometimes we say that creation is one of the strongest apologetics or, or one of the strongest arguments for God. I think that's a fair statement. But you can argue for God's existence without even having to use creation. However, when you look at creation, it's like, okay, it's pretty obvious that somebody had to be behind all this. And some branches of science have gone to this, you know, a little less religious format. They call it in in intelligent design. But, but we look at creation, and we can say, okay, it's, it's pretty obvious from creation that, that we see that God exists. But we don't even have to use creation to get that far. There are things like uh, man's, the argument that man has a need for something greater than himself. Man always worships something. Why is that? Well, that's an innate reality, a realization that man has that there's something bigger than him, that there is some higher being or higher power. So that's an argument for the existence of God, the morality of man. The problem with injustice, if we say that's unjust, why do we say that? Because there's something inside us that tells us there's a right and wrong, which points to a morality outside of herself, and again, points to God, the concept of beauty. Uh, there's innate belief. It's, it's not hard to believe in God. In, in fact, you can actually say this a lot of times to somebody who says, well, I don't really believe in God. You can ask this question, well, when did you stop? Because they started there, and that's, well, I got educated out of it. We have an innate belief. So, so we can say all of these things are actually apologetics for God, but that's not even the point of this verse. The point of this verse is not to say, in the beginning, God. It's to say that God, in the beginning, and so what he's, the point here is, again, to our story, is our story starts here. So it's not in the beginning, God. God was before the beginning. It's God, and then as man begins, he was there. That's how this setting up. And so the story is the story of mankind. It's an event that happens in the cosmos here. And it's an event that, in the way that it's set up here, it actually suggests a destination or an ending. This is a story that's going somewhere. So this is what this first verse is saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and everything that follows here is part of the story. And so actually, this statement, verse number one, is a summary of what's to come. You could call it introduction, but he's really saying, okay, everything we're going to talk about the rest of the morning here goes back to this first statement that God created the heavens and the earth, and here's everything that happened. Okay, so what does this tell us, though, about the earth. Well, it tells us that the heavens or the expanses or what we call space and the earth, which the word here can actually be translated land, which is interesting. And, and that word gets used land elsewhere in the Pentateuch. But those were created by God in the focal point of this passage. Genesis 1. It's, yes, it's on God, but it's actually on the land itself. And isn't that interesting? That as we open up the Bible and the scriptures, we take time to describe this place that our story is going to live out on. So it's like setting the scene is what it's doing here. So this is an introductory statement of what's going to happen. So we keep reading here. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay. What does that mean? Because we have this thing, and maybe you've heard this term, ex nihilo. Um, the, the word was spoken into existence. And yet we get to verse number two here, and it seems like the earth is already here. Like, what's going on with this verse? We're not exactly sure. And, and scholars are kind of, you know, debate this in different things. The impression here is maybe that when God started this story of us, that the earth in some form was already existing and that, that God took it and said, okay, now we're going to form it. 
Or it could be that God started and said, okay, we're going to start the story. And so he just, kind of like you throw a lump of clay on the, on the wheel, that he just puts something out and says, okay, now I'm going to work with what I just put out there. But it's interesting, though, from, from a couple of different standpoints, and we're going to get to one of them in a minute here. But the idea, though, is that it was this dark, churning, chaotic mass and God sets about to forming it, to creating something new or perfect, and something out of co- something that is cold and lifeless. He creates something that's warm and inviting and life giving. And then, verse number three, it says, "And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good." And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it was evening, and there was morning. It was the first day. And there's several things in that verse that we see show up here, just in how the, 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 uh, this story is told. It starts with, and God said. And this is where we find that God actually speaks the world as we know it into existence. And when he says something, it is so, or there was light. And then it says, That whatever he said, it became so, and then it was good. And then he goes on and says, and this was, you know, day one, day two, whatever, the evening, and in the morning, day three, day four. So there's this pattern that we see throughout this. But this tells us something else about God right here. It says, when God said, it tells us that God is the author and the authority in the story. God writes this story, and he writes this story with words. And even the story that we live is a story in existence that God writes with words. And there's power in the Word of God. And we talk about that when we use the Bible. But there's power in the Word of God because He is the author, author but the authority. Remember the story where the centurion um, comes to Jesus? And, and actually, he doesn't even make it. He sends service to Jesus. He's got a servant who's sick. And he says, I don't need you even to come to my house. Just say the word. Because I'm a man who's under authority. I understand how authority works. Somebody who's the ultimate authority, all he has to do is speak, and that thing happens. And that's what we're told about God. He is the author of the story. And that's important to us because as we live out this story, if we want to know how it works best, we need to check with the author of the story. So that's the point that's being made here in this verse as we continue to go on. He speaks things into existence. What he says goes, but what he says, his words also reflect and reveal him. So as we look at the world, we can see it as a story that's not just telling us what happened. It goes a layer deeper to say this is what's behind what's happening here, and this is who is behind what is happening here. We keep reading verse number 6. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So we see this pattern repeated. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land. And he gathered the waters and he called them seas, and God saw that it was good. Now this is an interesting verse here. You can just read right by here. And it's this idea that God takes this earth that's filled with waters and he splits the waters... From earth and, and, and the, the, the seas, but, or, or the planet. But then he also splits the seas on the earth so that we see land form. And so we see the development of land that comes from the splitting of the seas. Now, why does that matter? Well, we go back to the context. Why was this story being recorded? And what does this have to do with the Pentateuch? Well, the Pentateuch was this place where God is going to enter into a covenant relationship with his people. But as the people look back, they see a pattern of splitting waters. So the pattern of creation, the waters are split. And and you go from from Noah, when Noah is spared after the flood, what happens? The waters are split. When you come to the Red Sea, what happens? The waters are split. And that's where the people find themselves. And so this is saying, this is God saying, this is how I do business and for whatever reason. In fact, if you think about what happens after this, they're going to go into the promised land. But how do they get there? The Jordan splits. And so this is part of the story. The splitting of waters was going to be part of the history 
of Israel. We keep reading here, verse number 11, Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants. It doesn't just say plants, it says seed-bearing plants. Trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so, the land produced vegetation, Plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit and seed according to their... God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning. It was the third day. He says, let the land produce. And that's interesting. So the land, actually, these trees actually come up out of the land from what we're told here. But what are we also told? They're told that they were fruit bearing and seed bearing. Why does that matter? Well, fruit bearing is going to matter in a little bit when we find out that man gets here because he's probably going to get hungry and needs something to eat. But seed bearing tells us something else. It tells us what what we have is not all that's going to be. There's still more that's coming. And this land, this world that God created, was designed for life to sustain itself. So if, you know, the the tree and, and giving seed and there's more trees, and so we see this cycle. So it's supposed to sustain itself, but it's also supposed to propagate itself. So creation is actually going to expand in some ways. And so this is what it tells us about the earth. It was designed for life, both to sustain life and to propagate life. So this planet was never supposed to be, never created to be, this static thing. It was always filled, once we get to vegetation, it was filled with life. Now realize that's different from human life, but it's still life. But it tells us something then about God. What? And it's simply this, that God is the source of life. And that's a key thought that runs all the way through Scripture. But God is the source of life. And any time you separate yourself from God, you enter into death. And that's why Adam and Eve, when it says, like, when you eat of the fruit, you're going to experience death. It wasn't God being mean. It was like, you've just separated yourself from me, and you've moved into a different realm, and that realm is without life. And so God is the source of life. But we learn this about the earth then. We learned that the earth was actually blessed. And while it doesn't use that term, it will in just a minute when we talk about animal life. But the idea is that God made the earth and that he blessed it so that it could become more than what it was originally. And so... God blessed the earth, and we keep reading here. God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And we see that it was so when he made the two great lights, the sun and the moon. And we get down to verse number 18. God saw that it was good, and there was evening and morning. That was the fourth day. And then God keeps going. He says, and uh, into the fifth day, he says, let the waters teem with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So the, God created the great creatures of the sea and everything living, which... Uh, in the water which teems uh, and moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was all good and God blessed them blessed who? the fish and the birds and said be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase in the earth and so the earth itself the vegetation and then we see even the animal life here of birds and sea God blessed them And he blessed them when he said what? Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the seas. And so we see this idea of God blessing actually nature. Plant life, we see animal life here. And so God is actually then even speaking to his creation, but saying you can become something more. Verse number 23, the evening in the morning, that was the fifth day. But we get the sense then that God is up to something. And he's creating an environment or he's creating a place. And this is how this place is going to work. In verse number 24, God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. But we see that the earth was blessed. Plant life was blessed. These animals were blessed. They were going to be fruitful, multiply, propagate too. But why were all these things blessed? They were blessed for, you can put it up here, they were blessed for the sake of what was coming next or to Bless 
mankind. And that fruit was going to be necessary for mankind to eat. Now, the animals were not going to be necessary for mankind to eat. That was not the plan. But the animals were part of the environment that man was going to enjoy. And so we see creation is blessed for the purpose of blessing mankind. We also see here uh, the God, and we've been reading this over, so I'm going to put this in here right now. We see that God, um, everything he does, he calls it or recognizes that what it is is good. And so the earth was blessed. And so we go to the next thing there, I think. Is that right? Number four, the earth was the, and everything that God created was good. And what is meant by this word good? It's a Hebrew word tov. Um, maybe you've heard that used in the, the phrase mazel tov, um, which means basically good fortune. But the idea of good, what did, what did God mean, or what does this passage mean when God saw that the world was good or tov? It means this. It means that it was a beautiful, agreeable, pleasing, enjoyable a desirable place. When God created the world, he looked at there, he looked at the plants, and he looked at the trees, and he, he looked at the earth forms and the waters, and he looked at the animals, and he's like, yeah, that's nice. But it wasn't just for him. There was a purpose beyond just God. But he saw that it was enjoyable, desirable. He also saw, and this is part of the same word, tough, that it was as it should be. So when God made the world, he's like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. And, and, and we could say um, it was ideal, or it was functional, or it was even flourishing. Or we could even say this, it was good in that it was life-giving and beneficial and refreshing. And the world that we live in, the earth that we live on, is still that way. It's still good. Now, it's, you know, we'll get to this in other weeks. And, you know, it's been cursed and whatever like that. But we can look at the world and we can see it's good and it tells us that God is good and it reflects God's goodness. Kelly and I were just out in New Hampshire for the last week and did a bunch of hiking out in New Hampshire. I hadn't been to New Hampshire in decades. I went out there on a college road trip one time. Wow, what a beautiful place. But when you get out there, when I get out there in nature out there in the world that God created, and I'm walking up on these trails. That's the unfortunate thing. We're, you're in the White Mountains, which means you do climb up quite a bit. But, uh, but when you get out there, and it's like, oh, this, is, this is incredible. And, I, you know, on what day was it? Wednesday or Thursday? I think it was Thursday. We had lunch up on a, a, a Kootenai. Is that right? Something like that. A peak and whatever. But we were sitting there on this waterfall, and it was just kind of dried up because it was the end of the season. But, it, I mean, I'm sitting on the edge, and right here, it drops off like 50 feet. And I'm sitting just on this rock ledge, and I look out there, and there's this huge valley that's just spread out in front of me. And, and we were a little past peak, but we see all the different colors of the trees there. And I just said to my wife, I said, I think I could sit here all day. Well, why? Because it's good. And this is how God created it to be in nature itself. And the world itself actually has God's life in it, and it gives life. And I believe it actually can give life to us, at least in the terms of, of refreshment and enjoyment. And sometimes we just get out there and say, I just need to get out and, and take a walk and whatever like that. And it actually is a spiritual experience because we're experiencing the, the goodness of God, but it points us back to God. I can't walk through the mountains of Vermont and going, oh, this is incredible, while thinking, Whoa, who is incredible? The God who made that. And so we see that in the story here that it's, yeah, it's good, which tells us what the, about God? It tells us that God is good. And so as we look at creation, you can use creation as an apologetic to prove that God exists. But I think it's even stronger to say as we look at creation that we can use it to tell us about God, it reveals God. It reveals his attributes. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's eternal. He's faithful. He's sovereign. It also reflects his character like goodness, kindness, benevolence, care,
concern. It also even reflects his nature. He's beautiful. You ever think of God as beautiful? He's creative. All of these things that he is. And so we learn that about God. But then we switch back to earth. Even though it was created good, it wasn't created perfect. Even though earth was created good, it was not created perfect because earth was not created as it could have been created. It was created with space and room to grow and develop. There was nothing wrong with it. There was no sin in it. There was no failure in it. There was no abnormalities in it. But it was created with this potential for more. And so we could say it was good, but it was not all that it could be. And this is going to be important to us when we talk about this next week, when we get to uh, Genesis chapter 2. It was not perfect, not complete, because it could be better. Now, there was no, no, nothing wrong with it, but it could be there. Well, let's keep reading verse number 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image. And so finally, we've been talking about the world, the earth, God, the story, okay? We haven't talked about man elect. Until we get to this verse here, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the the livestock and the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And we finally start to learn some things about man. First of all, he was formed by God. Okay? Since he was created, he says, let us make man... Man was not spoken into existence. We'll talk about that next week. But man was made differently from everything else in nature. It was not spoken into existence. And it suggests that that he is different then from the rest of creation. So it's let there be spoken into creation. And God said, let us make. And so man was formed by God. Secondly, he was formed then in the image and the likeness of God. All the other things in creation says they were made according to their kind. When it gets to man, it says he was made in God's image. So plants were like plants and animals were like animals, but mankind was like, in some ways, God. So it tells us that God creates man. We'll find out in chapter 2 how that works. But the fact that God creates man, that we're told this, we are then informed a little bit of what God's like. Because I'm like God. So the way that I think or the way that I feel, the way that I relate, that's what God is like too. So if you want to know what God is like and understand what I'm saying, you can look at mankind and get a picture, get an idea. Oh, this is how God is. And so we're made in God's image. It takes both male and female to give us a full picture of God. We don't get a picture of God just by looking at the male side of the family or the female side of the side. You need both to get a picture of God. But this likeness is so cool because what does it do? It allows for communication and relationship. There's plants and they have their lives and then you get to animals and they're a little bit different and they have life, but they don't have the life that we have as humans. They don't really have any understanding of God and yet we do. Because we're made in this God's likeness, and so we're made to relate to God. And the fact that we're like God allows us to communicate. You know, when, when you talk to somebody and you understand them, probably you're talking the same language. And this is what, communication actually comes from the Latin word communis, which means common. And so God creates man in his image so that we can know God. Well, let's keep reading here. God blessed them, man, and Woman and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, or rule over it, or manage it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, every every living thing that moves around the ground. So man is also blessed, but why is man blessed? Man is blessed for the benefit of the earth. His job is to tame it, to rule it, to manage it, to take it, and to make it, to take that potential that's in it. And to make it something more. And there's an interesting interdependence that comes here then. Because we could say this about the earth. That the earth is man-dependent. 
It needs man to, to keep it. I mean, go by, go by a garden that hasn't been tended for, for two or three years. It's wild, right? Okay, earth needs to be tamed by man. And even the resources that we use, man have to discover. But at the same time, man is completely dependent upon the soil, the animals. That's where you get our food. And so we have this interesting relationship where earth is dependent on man and where mankind is dependent on earth. And then God goes on there and says, I give you every seed-bearing plant. They will be yours for food, the beasts and the earth. All of that, everything that I've made is, is for you, and it was so. And this finishes the sixth day. And then in chapter 2, it goes on and tells us about the seventh day and about the Sabbath. And it's interesting there that God took a rest and that his creation was supposed to copy him. But his creation would also involve the plant life and it would also involve human life, that there's this idea of, of rest that's built in to, to the earth that we live on. Well, let's, let's kind of wrap this up here, okay? This story, then, that Moses is telling to the Israelites, what is the point of this story, and, and why is that going to matter to him? It's this. It's the fact that God is redemptive, God is redemptive. If you notice that, I put that in quotes, and we'll give that the, the air quotes here. Because God is not redeeming in this story. Yet, he will. But what we see in this story is that God takes this void, or this, ma- this, this formless mass, and he says, let me make something of this. And he makes the plant life, and and he makes the nature, and he makes the animals, and he makes the man. But he starts with basically nothing here. And at some point in the past, he did start with nothing. He says, I'm going to make something. And and so it would would make sense even to to the Israelites. I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to make something. And it's also the same for us today to say that God looks at this and says, you know what, I can make something. In the beginning suggests a happily ever after. There's a beginning to this story and there's an end to this story in some ways that is coming. And this is what this story is telling us is that God takes things and he makes them better. And that's always the way that God works. So that brings us back to our original question. Why am I here? Well, I think this may be too simplistic, but I think this is the truth. We're here, or you could say it this way, why is earth here? Earth is here so that man has a place to call home. It's kind of cool, isn't it? He's like, I'm going to create man, but you know what I'm going to do for man? I'm going to give him a place. And that's going to be his place where he can flourish, where he can prosper, where he can enjoy everything I've created, where he can enjoy me, where he can look at nature and see and learn things about me, where he can actually have a relationship and can communicate with me. Man has a place to call home because earth is the place where God tells his story. And that story, by the way, includes you and me. And it even has an ending of sorts, a conclusion. This is all going somewhere. It's just not wildly going off into the blue. But man has a place to call him because earth is the place that God designed for man to experience his goodness. And our lives should be about goodness. That's God's intention. That's God's desire for us, that we experience goodness. And then thirdly, it's because The earth is the place that God designed for man to live out his purpose. Which is what? To propagate the goodness and the blessing of God. And we're going to talk about that next week. We talked about a place to call home next week. We talk about a garden to tend. So we start this story here. God's green earth. Why did he create earth? He created an earth for you and for me. So that we would have a place that we could enjoy, where we could experience God's goodness, where we could also understand God's greatness. But there would be a place then where his, I'm going to use world, it's not the best word, in our world, his existence in our world 
would intersect and where we could know him. Let's pray together. God, we look at this earth and I think we take it for granted. It's just here. It's what we know. It's where we live. It's just, you know, all the rules of nature, we just live by them and we're used to them. And yet I think maybe sometimes we forget that there's more to the story. And so, God, you've given us this place that's ours. It's a gift. It blesses us. And yet you've created us so that we can bless it. What a crazy idea. But God, I can't help but look at all of this and just celebrate your goodness, your greatness, your kindness, your majesty, your beauty. What an incredible God you are. But you didn't keep it to yourself. You shared it with us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I think the question that we all need to ask is, you guys, what am I here for? It's like, who am I here for? The question is, do you have a relationship with God? He made you in his image so that you could. And that relationship is through Jesus Christ, who became man, crazy part of the story, and died on a cross. To offer you forgiveness for sin, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. If you've never started a relationship with God, he wants you to have that. It's a gift. You don't have to do anything for it other than to ask. And invite Christ and his forgiveness into your life. If you're a, a Christ follower, this is a story for us, too. To be reminded of the God who is part of our story who has the ability to speak and everything changes. Maybe today you're in a place in your life where you just need God to speak. Maybe you're in a place in your life where you just need to be more aware of what God's doing in the world around you. I don't know. The Spirit can apply that. But God, we ask this morning that you would help us to look at this earth that you've given us and see it for the gift that it is, but see it also for the promise that it holds, for the story that it tells. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you put up there the grow zones on the back of your bulletin, every week we would try to give you an idea of how you can grow deeper in your faith. And this one is interesting but it's to engage nature. And so I want to encourage you at some point, and this is easy to do at this time of year, isn't it? But to pay attention to the beauty of God's creation. And to make it really practical, get your phone out, because that's our cameras, and capture some of these scenes. And maybe even at the end of the day, sit down and go through your pictures of the day and say, wow, look at that. And express thanks for the beautiful world that God has given you. Secondly, deliberately spend time in nature. Take a walk, go to the park. And use that time to pray because it gets us away from all those distractions and it gets us into the realm that God created and it gives us almost like a channel, I feel like, to pray. And then thirdly, worship the Creator. What are the characteristics of God that are evident in His creation? And boy, we didn't even mention many of these, but you can talk about His faithfulness, you can talk about His orderliness, you can talk about His immenseness. But what are the characteristics of God that are evident in his creation? Write down what you observe because they're for us that we can experience. Would you stand with me? Next week, we'll continue on in God's green earth. And we're going to talk about tending the garden. Thanks for joining me this morning. God bless you. Have a great week.